Good afternoon, everyone. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here with you today, even if in a virtual role. Um, but any medium, be it virtual, Zoom, or otherwise, can in no way diminish the extraordinary joy and pride we feel in our new graduates. This day is probably the happiest day in the annual life of any medical school. It's a day of extraordinary celebration, recognizing the amazing accomplishments of our new scientists and physicians. I hope you enjoy, in whatever ways you can, your own celebrations at home to complement our convocation today. But for me, convocation is also an opportunity to reflect and to give thanks. I think first, the students and us faculty would like to thank the families, the friends, the parents of our students who were always there for them, who cheered their many, many successes and comforted them in difficult times. It's also a time to give thanks to teachers, both past and present, folks who saw something in you, <clears throat> who inspired you, who did their best to convey the knowledge, skills, and attitudes that are going to become an integral part of the physician you are becoming today. It's also an important chance for us as faculty to thank you, the students, first for entrusting us with your medical education. You challenged us with insightful questions. You helped us in the discovery of new biomedical information and knowledge. And you were there by our side in the provision of safe, effective, and very importantly, compassionate care to our patients. And this brings me to the last group that I think both new and practicing physicians need to recognize and thank our patients. From the beginning, they have welcomed us into their lives, often as complete strangers, shared with us their life stories, offered their bodies for examination and intervention. <clears throat> From them, we learned important lessons about human disease and its pathologies and also its various treatments. But the thing that I think they have taught us that is most important is about the grace and resilience of the human spirit. They have been and always will be our greatest teachers, and we owe them an enormous debt of gratitude. So in closing, I'd just like to ask you all to please take care of yourselves, your loved ones, your future colleagues. And I also want you to remember that wherever your paths take you in this country, you will always have a place in our hearts and also under the dome. I want to welcome you all, new colleagues. Thank you very much. My name is Rakesh Goli, and I'm extremely honored to have been nominated by the class of 2020 to speak to everyone today. I wish you were under better circumstances and that we as a class could enjoy this day together. But life has a way of throwing curveballs when you least expect it. I want to start off by thanking everyone that's made today and the past four years possible for us. The administration, the deans, and faculty from the School of Medicine have opened their arms up to us and made an effort from day one to thoughtfully groom us into amazing clinicians and future leaders in the medical field. On this joyous occasion, I hope that many of you are able to celebrate with family. And I know that we would all personally want to thank our families for the unconditional love, support, and motivation that they have provided throughout our lives. Likewise, I believe the CAP system is one of the School of Medicine's greatest creations, and I'm so thankful to have a wonderful group of classmates to have learned alongside under a truly exceptional mentor. Lastly, I want to give a special shout out to my fellow classmates that have made this experience incredible. It's always fun to reminisce with friends, especially as we get closer and closer to the finish line. And I'm so thankful to be graduating from such an incredible institution with such an incredible class. When I first wrote to you about what I would say in the speech, I briefly mentioned the ups and downs that medical school offered and how this tested us in unique ways that ultimately pushed us outside of our comfort zone. It's incredible to think back to when we first entered the lecture room, fresh and ready to hear that first anatomy lecture. I remember before sitting down, I was thinking how I was going to do my absolute best to stay organized and on top of everything throughout medical school. Ironically enough, what followed was an hour of furiously writing down every minute detail of embryology and in the process not remembering a single word of what Dr. Beaver actually said. And one hour later, I remember flipping through sheets and sheets of carnage in my notebook and looking at my classmate next to me with that same dejected look who aptly said, dude, we're not going to survive. 
In the moment, I felt like truer words had never been said, but somehow through this disaster, we adapted and we learned to stay afloat. And honestly, that's what medical school has been about. It's been about surviving, adapting, and eventually finding a way to thrive. Even from that lecture experience, I came away with a couple pearls. Tip one, use OneNote. Tip two, maybe don't write down every single word the professor says. From the classroom onto the wards, we found ways to let our voices grow more and more confident while developing beautiful bonds with the patients that we cared for. It was then that we could see that those hours of sacrifice had finally started to pay dividends and that we could make the difference that we dreamed of from the start. And this was all built on a foundation of tough moments that pushed us to be better and to work harder. When these moments pushed us to our limits, that's when the camaraderie of medical school became more apparent. Those were the times that we would talk to each other and vent, or we would get that midnight Taco Bell with classmates and get back to work for the long night that lay ahead. In some ways, it was a culmination of those moments that over time morphed us into individuals that built a toughness and a grit to believe that anything was possible. And it will be those moments in the future that will shape the doctors that we will ultimately become throughout our career. With that in mind, I just want to take a moment to let everyone know how much I appreciate being a part of this class. Whether it was witnessing incredible athletic abilities on display throughout the Olympics, or hearing beautiful artistic creations during the holiday party, I'm constantly in awe, not only of what each and every one of you are able to accomplish, but how you do so in such a sincere and a humble manner. Having had the chance to work together and build relationship throughout these years, I'm astonished at the unique approach that everyone takes to learn and immerse themselves in medicine. Seeing the passion and the desire to improve as clinicians, communicators, and people has been a great source of inspiration for me. And as we move forward to the next step of our lives, I can't wait to see what this class is able to accomplish. In the current state of the world, the spotlight now shines bright on healthcare workers, and this is our opportunity to translate years of learning and absorbing medicine to our patients. Taking care of the sick and the vulnerable is what brought us here in the first place, and it's important that we reflect not only on the knowledge that we've built and the skills that we've acquired, but the words and the stories of our patients and the beauty of our profession as a whole. I wholeheartedly feel confident that our class will be able to handle any situation that comes their way with grace and poise. I wish nothing but the best for the class of 2020. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of this special day. Hello. Each year it is my privilege to address our graduating masters and PhD students. Today we celebrate a collection of scholars from a wide range of scientific fields. Medical historians who research past pandemics, cell biologists working to cure cancer, and engineers who create medical devices. Despite this variety, all students will recite the same graduate student oath, in which they pledge to uphold a number of important commitments and practices during their careers. I would like to draw the student's attention to one in particular now. You will pledge to be an ambassador of science to the public and strive to be honest, respectful, and unbiased when engaging the public. Indeed, each of you is likely already serving in this capacity as your family and friends as source for medical information. I draw your attention to the specific pledge today because in times like these, we are acutely aware of the importance of science and the public's shared understanding of fact. It is my charge to our graduating students to embrace your responsibility to educate the public throughout your career. To close, I want to simply say thank you to our graduating students. Thank you for all that you've done while at Hopkins, but more than that, thank you for all that you will do for science, medical discovery, and society going forward. It has been an honor and pleasure to be your colleague during your time at Hopkins, and we will stay connected in the future. On behalf of your teachers, mentors, family, and friends, we celebrate you and are proud of all that you've accomplished. From all of us, congratulations to the graduating class of 2020. Each year, the graduating masters and PhD students select a speaker to represent them at convocation. It is now my pleasure to introduce this year's graduate student speaker, David Ottenheimer. David joined our neuroscience PhD program in 2015 after receiving a degree in psychology from Yale University. He conducted his thesis research with Dr. Patricia Janik, where he studied the neuroscience of decision-making and remarkably completed his degree in just four and a half years. Using rats as a model, David studied which neurons in the brain signal when rats are faced with different decisions. Outside of the lab, David actively contributed to our school's diversity and inclusion efforts. 
founding his program's Student Diversity Committee, and serving on the university's PhD Advisory Committee. David will be starting a postdoc this summer in Seattle at the University of Washington, where he will study how neurons across the brain participate in learning about the rewards in our environment. I'm pleased to present David Ottenheimer. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. It's a unique honor to be able to virtually address the School of Medicine graduates as we all watch from our homes. We're graduating during a time when the public's interest in biomedical science is unusually high, so I thought I'd share my perspective on interactions between science and the broader community. In many ways, our research depends on public support for science, but this public attention sometimes comes with unfortunate side effects. One of these is the all too often misrepresentation of scientific results we see in the media. Although incorrect scientific reporting can be dangerous at its worst, today I'm going to share one of my experiences that veers more toward the comical. It all started when I published my first paper during my PhD. To summarize my work briefly, by giving different tasty rewards to rats and recording from their brains, I found that the majority of cells in an understudied brain region, the ventral pallidum, are very active for preferred foods and less active for less preferred foods. This means ventral pallidum could be a good region to study to understand how we make food choices. I believe I speak for many of us when I say that one of the reasons we pursue a PhD is that we hope our work will one day improve public health. For this reason, I was given, when I was given the opportunity to have the Johns Hopkins Office of Communications publish a press release on my first paper, I enthusiastically accepted. When my paper came out, I was delighted to see that a few news sources picked up on the story on my research. Most of them just copy and pasted the Hopkins press release though, and none of them asked me for quotes. A few days later, I received my first interview request. It was not at all what I was expecting. It came from a producer of a late night radio show in the UK, asking me to chat on air about, why, about the brain and why we choose sausage rolls. Sausage rolls? I was so confused. I sent a note to my PhD advisor asking for advice. She suggested that I try Googling my name to see what came up. What followed was the most baffling, disheartening, and hilarious autopsy of science communication gone wrong. In the press release, we used a buffet of foods like mac and cheese and mashed potatoes to describe a scenario where your brain needs to evaluate different food options. In the UK, where neither of these foods are common, they changed the example to a local favorite, sausage rolls. This led to a series of wackier and wackier headlines that included, scientists say we can blame bad eating habits on our brain getting turned on by sausage rolls, Blame sausage rolls for bad eating habits because they turn people on and dominate brains, scientists say. And my favorite, we all have a sausage roll gene that helps us choose what food to eat. Yes, a sausage roll gene. How did this all happen? I went back to the original press release and began to see what went wrong. I talked about a dominant neural signal, about neurons having increased firing for preferred rewards, and a high level of activity in ventral pallidum. It wasn't hard for the news outlets to jump from those descriptions to foods dominating your brain, firing you up, and turning you on. I think the moral of the story is that public knowledge of scientific concepts is often quite minimal, and the people disseminating new knowledge are often more interested in making an exciting story than properly representing the data. This is something we're seeing currently as pilot studies and pseudoscience alike are rushed out by the media to people anxiously awaiting developments on COVID-19. This is one area where all of us graduating scientists can help out. Regardless of where our careers take us, we must all be ambassadors for science, explaining the scientific process to those around us and pointing out misconceptions where we see them. If we can all help make science a little more understandable, we will be doing a whole lot of good, both for the scientific endeavor and for society. I want to finish by congratulating all of today's graduates. I am so proud of all the work you have done and to be standing here with you virtually today. Oh, and since this is pre-recorded, current David, the speech is over now, so you can stop cringing while watching a video of yourself and go ahead and treat yourself to a sausage roll. You've earned it.